everybody, this is Birch. Um, you can't just divide people into groups. I mean, arguably, that's a problem we're having right now in our society. Uh, but if I can take a look at kind of the, the people working in comics and and almost divide them into three groups for, for one moment. Now, there's obviously lots of individuals and they, the people break the rules all the time. The exceptions make the all that kind of stuff is true. But generally speaking, we kind of have three groups of people. We have people who are relatively highly successful, view comics as a business, who are, you know, you know work for, some work for themselves, some work for the big two, um, some, you know, are, but, but they all share kind of a common trait of being a little bit bewildered, a little bit confused by the social media angst, the fan kind of reaction, the, this, this whole dynamic that you hear about online, it doesn't make a lot of sense and it doesn't really resonate with them because it doesn't impact their, their daily life. They're making comics, they're working to increase their page rate, they're uh, try, you know, try to get some freelance deals, they're signing some other stuff. I mean, that's, they're just kind of going on about their work, thinking about, you know, a, a, how much they love comics, but also that it's a business that they, you know, maybe some of them are political in nature in the sense that they are trying to make the right friends in the right places in order to kind of influence and get more of their work up top. But they're driven by getting work out and making money. That doesn't mean they're, they're, they're only all about money. They, they clearly have a love, some, some, I don't know about all, but some have a love for the industry. But, but you know, by and large, you know, money talks and they're, they're interested in their rate. Um, I'll, I'll throw out some examples of people I'd say who would fit into this category would be, you know, yeah, certainly Mark Miller would fit into this. I think Sean Murphy, as you've heard his comments on, on this channel before, Scott Snyder fits into it. Dan Slott fits into that, believe it or not. These are people uh, who, who largely have made money and continue to look to make money and are interested in kind of exploring and doing new, new things in comic books, but, you know, are, are focused on business. There are people who tend to be interested in some of the more kind of financial aspects, business aspects of the industry. They're curious if this, you know, if A and B happen, will it lead to C? Will there be a, a boost of, of revenue that, you know, is equivalent in another direction? That's how they operate. Now, sticking with Dan Slott for a moment, um, we'll get to the second group. I was having a, a conversation, a text conversation uh, with a creator who fits into the second group who I would call, you know, people who still are kind of in the mood that this is a high school club. People who don't, don't view this as a business don't really know how to view it as a business. They're just kind of happy to have some peers who are more or less interested in the same things they are. And they are, you know, they, they, they're just, it's, it's like the Dungeons and Dragons club that they had in high school made, made, you know, real life. They are less concerned about their page rate and they tend to be under skilled, underpaid for, you know, the industry they're in, not necessarily for their skills. Uh, but this text conversation I was having, uh, that we're talking about that Dan Slot. Uh, Disney Plus documentary where it was uh, making Marvel comics and you know it was the one where Dan Slott looked like a buffoon because he was answering Twitter and everything else and the person texts going whose house was that anyway I'm like w what do you mean it's like which house was my response like the house that Dan Slott was in you know where they kept filming him like around Christmas time he's in some house whose house do you think that was and I said that's Dan Slott's house and the answer I got back was, a comic writer can't afford a house like that. And it was, um, it was profoundly sad to, to, to read that because the person was serious. They truly could not fathom the idea that a, you know, I don't know, you saw little clips of what looked like a relatively nice house um, could, could be something obtainable from somebody who worked in comics. And, and so that's why I say the, the group, you know, doesn't, they, they view kind of Twitter and socialization as an added perk. They view uh, the ability to kind of chat around and, and like, uh, you know, as, as a benefit. And, you know, who are these people? Well, it'd be, these would be like the Danny Lores, the Joe Glasses, you know, the people in that realm. You know, Joe Glass posted something about wanting to afford a house. Uh, but it would be like 80% of his salary. It would be his yearly salary. I don't know. You could, you could basically back into the math on it and uh, figure out the guy is, is kind of self-admitting that his take-home is less than 20 grand a year. And, and, and if, you're, if, you're, if that's true, I mean, so either, you know, one, that's not true at all, and, and 
you know, Joe has a, a horrible uh, view of actually how much things cost. Or two, that's, that's what, you know, that, that's what he's taking home on a leading cool independent writer. I mean, omnibus salary, in which case it's not a business. It's, it's, it's a hobby. Uh, you know, for what it's worth, I joke about it. This YouTube channel makes more than that a year, just for what it's worth. <laughs> I, a lot of which goes to comic shops and other things, but uh, th that's not that's not money. That's not business. And again, I'll say the same thing I said in the first group. It doesn't all have to be about money. Of course, it's not all about money. You have to have a love for what you're doing. But at the same time, if it's not a little bit about money, then it, it leads you to kind of strange places. It, it leads you to a feeling of, does any of this really matter? Do, do, you know, do I have to you know, behave on social media because I'm worried about my paycheck and supporting my family or my friends or whatever, or me, you know, whatever it happens to be. But that's that second group. And, and the, the baffling part of the second group is not why they're employed in comics, because, you know, fundamentally, the publishers are, this is a grindhouse type profession where, you know, they're, they're just looking for the cheapest possible rate to get Spider-Man comics on the shelves. The quality of the Spider-Man comic doesn't really matter too much. They just, they need a, they need a product out there. Why do they need a product out there? Well, we've talked about this before for, for marketing purposes, for licensing deals, for attached deals, for, for all, you know, because that they need a comics business, a comics industry that they can point to that helps enable the billion dollar licensing and movie business. They're in the comic business. They can't just stop. So it makes sense that the publishers would hire people who, you know, skills aren't necessarily the top of the list. And if they will work cheap, that's great. You know, how can we produce these comics for as little as possible? I, I've been in rooms with, uh, you know, editors uh, back in the day, not, not the current crop, but uh, where people who are more or less in the business of licensing are openly speculating about could they just offshore the entire comic production, the writing, the, the entire thing. And the challenge is that the, you know, the language doesn't fit. It, 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 it isn't, you know, to afford good language, to afford good writing, it costs more and what you could just pay domestically if you get your writers down to like $50, $55 a page. No problem. Barely an inconvenience, as they say. Uh, but that's that second group. And the second group is growing rapidly in comics because the first group, the business-minded group, well, they're, they're busy kind of increasingly doing their own thing. They're carving their own deals out with, uh, with crowdfunding or with Netflix or with Amazon or wherever it happens to be. They're, they're, they're carving out their own deals and you'll notice a lot of those people, even though they bring others along, are by and large individuals. They're not part of big groups. They're not part of a 30-person clique. They're not part of a, uh, you know, a Google Docs group uh, somewhere where they're you know, gossiping and speculating the industry. They'll dip in and dip out kind of out of morbid curiosity, but they're, they're, they're by and large individuals. The second group, the high school club group, that's definitely people who team together. That's definitely the, I mean, if, in lack of uh, monetary currency driving it, social currency is pretty much what we have left. So that group is highly, highly motivated to, you know, talk, gossip, be on DMs, be part of several private Facebook groups, all, all the rest. That, you know, it create slacks. Somebody, the X slack the uh, X-Men writers who had a Slack. Slack is just a tool to communicate. Everybody who's worked in a tech company is aware of it. Uh, but uh, this this group, it's not special. Having used Slack for, uh, boy, what has to be six, seven years now at least, uh, it's it's just a tool, like a Trello board or any of the rest. I mean, God help us if uh, comic people discover that one. But uh, it, somebody about six months ago figured out because part of the, the drive of this high school group was I've got to work on an X book because I really want to be part of the X Slack. I need to be part of that community, part of that private group. And then somebody figured out that you could start a Slack board for free. You, you, can, you can actually have a, a functional group. You get to make your avatar. You get to have that for nothing. 
And so like, it was like, it was like a bomb went off and in comics people's heads. Suddenly there's, there's dozens and dozens of, of comic book slack uh, tools out there. It's like, Whoa, it's easy to set up. It doesn't cost me anything. And I get a chat with my friends and have kind of little gossip sessions and in little folders. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that. That's anyway. So that's a second group. The third group is basically members of the first and the second, but you know, in, in th these are the veterans. The third group are the people who uh, got into comics in the seventies and eighties and maybe a little bit the nineties. And they've, uh, and I hate to, to put it this way, but they've aged out of this whole process. So they're still able to get work from time to time. And some of them have saved their money and are doing fine and kind of just, you know, go to cons, enjoy kind of doing creative work from time to time. I think Bob Layton fits into that quite nicely. Uh, Walt Simonson fits into that nicely. Somebody who legitimately loves comics and is stuck around and is still in it, uh, but doesn't get regular work and doesn't really belong to, you know, group number one or group number two. And then you have, uh, you know, people who are kind of older, maybe didn't do as well with their money. And these are people who are you know, still trying to get in work, but have a certain feeling of bitter desper desperation. Because what they've seen is that their, uh, their, their basic profession has gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So now they, they're, they're, they can't be, they, you know, the comic business can't afford them. Their page rates that they had back in, you know, the 80s and 90s are laughable now. They, they can't remotely get that. You could get, you know, 10 VDIL comics for the page rate of some of these people who wrote in the, in the you know, in the 80s. And that group is, so, so that third group is just, they're people who are older, out of comics, getting occasional work, are either peaceful in their life about it, or bitter because they, they need that money and the money isn't there. And so they're, you know, they'll go to cons, they'll sell things. And, and kind of tell the difference between the two. If you go to a con, you get a, kind of a creator who's uh, more or less cheerful about kind of their lot in life. And, you know, you get another who's, uh, you know, pretty grumpy, I'll just say, about where the industry has gone. And uh, they don't find themselves part of really any clique or any group because they're old. They got that old man smell, as, you know, a younger comic creator would say about some of our greats. Um, and and that's, you know, again, there's, there's exceptions to all that. But we have a... a dysfunctional business. I was going to say a poorly functioning, but I think the best way to say it is just dysfunctional. We have a dysfunctional comic industry, still producing comics, still has the ability to produce comics, still sells comics. In many cases, the door is still open to sell a lot more comics. You know, the good news about manga doing well, the good news about YA and Scholastic and some of these other things doing well is that the door is open to expand. If Marvel kind of targeted the newsstand, got a hot run, you know, focused on some of this stuff, um, you could see a comic easily getting back into kind of the glory years of where things were at in the 80s in terms of newsstand sales. You can see that. If Marvel one day or Penguin Random House decided to offer returnability and, you know, you throw that all out Avengers uh, you know, title up there, yeah, that title would do pretty well on, you know, whatever the newsstand is now. So it's, it, the business is still there. So that's, that's the good news in all this, but it functions in a dysfunctional way because the publishers are fundamentally just trying to drive it down to be as cheap as humanly possible, which means more and more they're pulling from that second group. They're pulling from the group who has little to no business acumen, little to no dream of what it means. You know, I know uh, there's been classes, uh, Scott Snyder teaches some classes, and there's been kind of different attempts to educate, uh, you know, members of the comics business. And Scott, if you're listening right now, and, and I know you've listened to some of these, please, I, I beg of you, in one of your classes upcoming, get somebody in, not me, but get somebody in who can talk business, basic fundamentals, like, hey, here's what a financial planner is. Did you know that a financial planner you could afford for $50 a year and they'll, you know, help you kind of organize your books and they'll help make sure that uh, you're, you're getting good rate on insurance. You're not getting screwed over and, you know, hey, here's how you can manage your money better. And hey, you know, give, you know maybe you don't jump into an agent right away. It sounds like a, a fun idea and it's certainly something to brag about in your social circle, but, you know, it's, it's a cost train. Maybe you don't do that. And hey, here's what uh, here's what the average rates of writing a script in Hollywood and some other places are. This is what 
you know, this is this is what money is worth in other places. I, I, I please, you know, if, for those of you who are doing classes, please add something like that, please. Because it's it's painful on the outside to watch, you know, group number two uh, struggle and, and kind of fall into the only thing I care about is, you know, how many friends I have on Twitter. I mean, the, the amazing, the baffling part of Twitter is Elon Musk buys it. There's this brief like, we've got to leave Twitter. Let's go to, you know, one of these other sites. The other sites uh, like Hive proceed to suck. They're not going to true social. So now they're like, oh my God, I got to get back on Twitter. How do I do that without losing face? Which has been a, a topic of conversation, another one in my text quite a bit lately is, how do I, you know, do you think, am I, do you think other creators are going to think bad of me if I go back to Twitter? That's the question. And the answer that I give is, fuck them. Make money. You know, you, you got to get exposure for your business out there. Seriously. How much, you know, Tess Fowler thinks of you? Uh, Jesus, who cares? Seriously, who cares? You, you get work. You know, be on all these sites. Yeah, you know, set up a shell on Hive and on Mastoon and Tumblr and and, and everywhere else you can go. Facebook too. Yeah, I know it's for old people and, you know, uh, the, whatever. But make sure you have an Instagram. Make sure you have your whole assortment of social media because that's your resume. Don't treat your resume like, a, you know, a social group. Treat it like business. Anyway, like I said, it doesn't all fit together. But it, but it makes sense. It's a dysfunctional business when the publishers are going to chase how to get the comic produced for the cheapest possible rate they can, you're going to go after people who don't really have a huge value on money. And they, but you know, people have to have value in something. They're not just empty shells walking around. They have to value something. So what they value is social. They value kind of this, you know, the, the, the click that they can be in. But the click doesn't pay anything. And the click is also highly, highly political. I mentioned at the very beginning that first group tends to be, you know, political, but they're political with the aims of gaining power and gaining financial uh, stability, gaining the ability to kind of control their outcome. The other form of politics is just, you know, trying to climb the social ladder, absent the money. And the people who are involved in that are dangerous because they're, they're playing for nothing. Anyway, again, it doesn't all fit. There are obviously individuals. There's people who do not fit nicely into all three groups, you know, one of those three groups. Um, but in general, if you look at the comics business, you find that's a decent way to categorize things. So what's the, what's the, you know, is there a solution here? Or is this just an observation? Well, the solution is the first group is a good group. The group that's out for business and trying to make money and kind of grow. That's, you know, sometimes they're good people. Sometimes they're not good people. But being motivated by success is a positive attribute. Whether the person is good or bad, that's still a net good for the business. So we need to encourage more of that. The second group needs to wake up. Quite bluntly, this is not a high school club. Get you know, got you've got to upskill your skills. <laughs> you've got to uh, you've got to get stronger so you can. You, and you have to have the dream of getting into group number one from your own merits, not somebody not not being in the right gossip groups long enough that, you know, maybe somebody, the, the next Warren Ellis comes in and flirts with you and you can, you know, turn around and blackmail that person for a million dollars. And that's how you make your success. <laughs> I laugh, but that's really been some people's plans. And then we need to give the third group, you know, especially the people who love comics work uh, because these, these are people who have uh, stuck it out and, you know, some are, are correctly bitter about the whole thing. And those that aren't, you know, God bless them, you know. Bob, again, Bob Layton, I, he, he's just cheerful, doing his thing. You know, one of the artists for Secret Wars, still happy. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below, and thanks for listening.